Segev. Uh, I'm currently working as a software architect at the Sun Group at Cisco uh, after the acquisition of Intucell. I'm going to tell you a bit uh, about uh, building large scale, scale out, high performing systems uh, in Python from my experience uh, building the uh, Intucell Sun solution. Uh, this is going to be a bit of an uh, opinionated talk. I'm going to talk mostly about um, paradigms, packages, models that I used. Uh, I tell you what I liked, what I liked a bit less, uh, but uh, don't take it too hard if uh, I didn't mention your mo favorite module or package or uh, the way you like to do things. Uh, and then actually I learned uh, today in a keynote session this morning that there are tons of others, uh, other ways out there to uh, uh, build high-performing systems that uh, uh, this world is always changing and always uh, including. We're building self-optimizing cellular networks, or for short, SON systems, as they're called in the industry. Um, the idea is to take a statically configured cellular network and turn it into kind of a living, breathing network that constantly changes and adjusts itself according to the users, according to their traffic patterns. We have a few challenges, okay? First challenge is how do you connect to all those antennas in the network uh, simultaneously to constantly make those adjustments? Second challenge is how do you read and analyze all the tons of statistics that you can get from the network in order to make intelligent changes? And the third is how you synchronize all this work across multiple data centers. Because unfortunately for us, uh, large, uh, and even not so large, cellular operators, uh, cellular networks are not managed from a single location. Um, for example, uh, AT&T's network is managed from 10 different data centers. We started off as a very small startup, practically building an MVP. The development team uh, constantly hit the worst thing that could happen to a development team, uh, which was business success. Uh, we had Pelephone here as, a, as our first customer. Uh, for those of you who are not local, Pelephone is a local uh, cellular operator. And although this is a small country, managing an entire network was definitely not a trivial thing. And believe it or not, but AT&T was our next customer. Now, that was a complete different ballgame. It made scaling the system a thousand times bigger than it uh, was before. Now we're already deployed in tens of operators around the world, but uh, that's, uh, that's a different story. We need to grow the capacity of our system. And we did it by using three paradigms, let's say. One is concurrency, the other is parallelism, and the last is distribution. Uh, so allow me a moment of terminology just so uh, we're all on the same page. When I say concurrency, I mean running multiple tasks in overlapping time periods, but not necessarily at the same time. Think about one CPU just performing multiple tasks. When I say parallelism, I mean performing multiple tasks actually at the same time. For example, on multiple CPUs. And when I talk about distributions or distributed systems, I mean systems that execute tasks in parallel, but over several machines, possibly in several different data centers. I'm, remi I'm reminding you that the, the challenge that we have was how to concurrently connect to thousands of cell towers, thousands of antennas in the network to con continuously tweak their parameters, like uh, tilt and their coverage and handovers from that antenna to the others. Most uh, non-Python developers uh, will use threading as their go-to choice for uh, uh, concurrency. However, uh, as I hope all of you know, threads are not such a good choice because uh, they have two properties that make them very dangerous. Uh, one is that there is shared memory. Everything is shared between two threads. And the other is that there is unexpected context switching. I mean, you can never know when your thread is going to switch out and another thread will run and might uh, overrun some uh, shared memory that you used. These two traits uh, lead to what we call here uh, race conditions, right? Race conditions are so dangerous and so hard to avoid that even the C Python interpreter itself is not really thread safe. Uh, and I hope you all also know that C Python implementation has a global lock that makes sure that 
at any given time, only one thread actually executes Python code, which means that you cannot hope to achieve uh, parallelism, or at least in your Python code, uh, by using threading. Threads are also very resource intensive. I mean, you can't really open uh, a thread for every antenna in the network, at least not always level threads. Uh, threads do have an upside. It's really easy to use. You can just write uh, synchronous code, just call a socket, get whatever is in the socket, read from it, use this data, write to another socket, and if you wanted to run in the background, you just wrap it in a thread. So it's very easy to, to develop using threads. If your application is I.O. bound, then you do still get concurrency. I mean, most I.O. operations do release the global lock. Uh, so does sleep operations and some other blocking operations. If you have any C extensions, then these extensions are canned and are usually encouraged to release the global lock. So if you're running code mostly in a C extension, you can write, run it in multiple threads and actually get some parallelism as well. Also, if you're not using the, uh, let's say, standard CPython interpreter uh, or another implementation of Python, like .NET's Iron Python or Java's Jython, then you don't have to worry about the global lock because that's just an implementation detail of CPython. If your application is I.O. bound, then there is another choice. Uh, a lot of different names for this paradigm. Some call it coroutines, some call it fibers, cooperative multi-threading, uh, there are many, many different names, uh, but uh, the concept is generally the same. You have thread-like entities, only context switch in very predictable times, namely doing I.O. or doing blocking operations. This makes coroutines or similar implementations much safer because you know exactly when, uh, context, you, when you're about to lose the context. So, Race conditions are still possible, but are much, much easier to avoid and mitigate. Now, these implementations are usually also very, very lightweight. Um, in most implementations, uh, you can open as many uh, coroutines or uh, uh, light greenlets as you want. Uh, for example, one for every antenna in the network. Uh, so it's also easier to develop like that. You don't have to worry about uh, creating pools. There are many libraries out there that help you implement this paradigm. Uh, there is Twisted, Tornado, G-Event. Uh, if you're using Python 3, uh, like you, there is uh, Async I.O. in the standard library. L let's, look, let's take a, a deeper look at this. Um, the basic idea is actually pretty simple. Um, a coroutine can be implemented, for example, by a Python generator, like these two. These generators uh, simply yield control when they want to do a blocking operation, like read from a socket, or sleep. Usually you have some kind of event loop that what it does is just gather all those sockets and all those sleep operations and use some low-level uh, operating system uh, primitive like select or KQ or EPOL or wait for multiple objects if you're on Windows. This event loop usually uh, uh, can detect when one of those sockets is ready. For example, has some information in it. Uh, or when the timeout uh, is passed, because it can take like the minimum uh, timeout from all uh, sleeping, from all currently sleeping uh, greenlets. And to return control to the correct greenlet, you only have to just call its next method, because just uh, generate. This is a very uh, simple and naive implementation of, of this paradigm. And again, if you're lucky enough to be using Python 3.5 onward, then there are actually two new keywords uh, built into the, syn to the syntax of uh, the language. Actually, there are more than two, but uh, let's focus on these two for now. Async def, and the other is await. Now, there's nothing too magical about them. Async def basically means that this function is going to be a generator of type coroutine, and await is just like yield, or actually yield from. Uh, if you're familiar with that syntax. Async IO uh, in the standard library also uh, includes an event loop here that uh, knows how to correctly and efficiently handle these kinds of coroutines. The problem with this method, uh, although it's really nice, is that you have to be very explicit about 
where you have blocking operations. Wherever you have a blocking operation, like reading from a socket or sleeping, you have to yield or await. And, and that's OK, because explicit is better than implicit. But what happens if, uh, if you have existing code that is not written like this? It's written like normal code. Read from a socket, get information, write to another socket. Uh, what if you're using uh, some kind of third-party library, like know, requests or any other network framework or library or whatever? Gevent is a very, very good trade-off. Uh, Gevent is a library implementing uh, this, exam this uh, exact paradigm. Um, and it has a really nice little feature that allows you with two short, simple lines of code to magically replace all your threads into greenlets, which are a type of coroutine. And all the blocking operations, uh, like socket operations, sleep, uh, file operations, uh, they're all just magically replaced with uh, context switches. Now, it's a bit of magical, and magic is usually not such a good thing, but it does allow you to uh, use existing code base and existing packages. And eventually, that's what we did. I mean, we haven't yet migrated to Python 3, uh, unfortunately for us, but it's uh, a really big project. And we do have uh, existing code, and we do use third-party third packages, and this way we just get, uh, instantly get proper concur concurrency without fearing threads. And we can very easily open as many uh, greenlets as we want to handle uh, as many uh, requests as we have. I mean, it's not requests, I mean, as, much, uh, as many elements in the network that we need to handle. OK, so we talked about concurrency. What happens when uh, you actually need to use more than one CPU because uh, you actually have computations to make. Well, we had that problem. Uh, our system constantly parses hundreds of gigabytes of logs, statistics, information pulled from the network. And the system already always has to analyze them and parse them and make intelligent uh, decisions. Now, uh, we're not using Python 3, and we are using CPython, and we don't want to write and manage C extensions, and uh, we don't have any JIT compiler integrated yet. So we're left with the option of spawning a process to handle the work. And there are generally two approaches in how to do that. Uh, the first approach is to use the built-in, the standard library multiprocessing model. It's a really handy model. It has an interface which is suspiciously similar to the one of threading. You can simply pass a function uh, to a process, just wrap it in a process. You can pass arguments in Python. You can get uh, return values back uh, through pipes, but who cares? So it's almost seamless to just take a function and run it on another core. Sometimes <laughs> magic kinds of wears off. Okay, so sometimes magic is not always such a good thing. And when we try to use it, um, things got a bit weird. And we had like very weird issues. So we had to deep in, uh, uh, dive into the implementation of of uh, multiprocessing. And what we found is that the multiprocessing model uh, is implemented by forking the current interpreter and simply calling the given function in the child process. Now, that's a really neat trick because um, you can pass variables and you can just like pass a, a reference to a function, but it's not such a good idea because, well, forking is a dangerous thing. Um, for example, it does not play well with gevent. Uh, when the Python interpreter is forked, then the gevent uh, event loop is also forked, and also all the greenlets are forked, and they just keep running in the background. And this is hardly what you want when you just want to call a function. It also doesn't really play well with threads, because uh, forking a multi-threaded application, uh, if anyone ever tried it, then you know that it's possible. But you have to do it really carefully. And there are a lot of pitfalls, and it's really hard to get right. 
It also doesn't really play well with uh, any large data sets in memory. When you fork a process in the Unix environments, then uh, there is a copy and write mechanism, so only written uh, uh, data sets are actually copied. But since the Python uh, garbage collector holds reference counts on the objects themselves, then actually objects are written to all the time. So in no time, the entire uh, Python interpreter, the entire memory area will be uh, replicated. Good news is, uh, and I noticed this uh, just this week, uh, this is fixed actually in Python 3.4, and when you're using the multiprocessing module, you can uh, uh, opt out of forking, you have to be very explicit about it, and you can ask uh, uh, the module to spawn uh, a separate um, interpreter for you. We're not using Python uh, 3, so we had to go uh, and lose the multiprocessing module uh, in favor for the uh, other approach, which is simply spawning ourselves uh, a subprocess uh, and a Python interpreter in a subprocess. Using the subprocess module and a nifty little uh, package called RPC, which, is al which allows a very easy Python to Python RPC. Uh, so it's really easy to just build uh, a very, very nice interface uh, like this. Uh, just, you can just run in process a function. Uh, all the arguments are uh, passed by RPC uh, to the slave process. Uh, the return values are just returned also through RPC. If there's an exception, it's just raised. So it's super easy to use. Uh, this module called slave process, it's, it's a 20 liners of code using uh, subprocess and RPC. And this is what we ended up doing. Uh, of course, only in the very specific places when we actually needed uh, to parallelize our code for uh, just to use more CPUs in cases that we actually needed uh, calculations done. So we talked about concurrency, we talked about parallelism. That's all nice and well when your application sits in a single machine. But what happens when you have to uh, use more than one machine or you have to uh, be present in more than one physical location? We had that problem. Uh, like I told you before, large networks like uh, at and are not managed from a single location and the amount of data that we need to constantly analyze, parse and store uh, requires us almost 200 servers uh, in AT&T alone. Uh, these servers are spread in a 10 different physical locations because this is how the network is managed and built. And it has to work as a unified cluster because it's just one system optimizing. I will give you two tips that I picked along when uh, writing this uh, system. Well, the first tip is if you want to build uh, the easiest way to build a distributed system is just let someone else do it for you. Or at least let someone else do all the heavy lifting. Now, distributed databases are already distributed systems. They're a really good place to store, uh, well, a logically single point of truth or uh, state of your application. Now, usually this state is also accessible from all servers. This is also a really good way to, uh, a really good way to uh, uh, communicate between components. Now, we used MongoDB uh, and had pretty good experience with that, but uh, again, there are tons of other. Now, the second tip I have to give you is try to avoid locking. Well, if you can. It's not always possible, but locks generally lead to deadlocks, live locks, uh, starvation, tons of other things. Uh, what we did was uh, use a kind of optimistic transaction model, which means that we had different nodes uh, thinking about changing the network, but none of them actually did anything to the network, but just uh, hold, held a log or uh, a set of change requests to the network stored in the database. And we had a very serial process that uh, verified consistency between change requests and made sure that uh, no two nodes uh, never did ever did any uh, colliding changes to the network. If you have an IO bound app, try to avoid threading. Continue, consider using gevent, it's pretty good. Uh, but if you're in Python 3 and you're willing to only use the few select packages that actually give asynchronous uh, interfaces, use async IO. If you're CPU bound, try uh, just opening a subprocess and using RPC. It's really uh, worth checking out. If you're in Python 3, check out the multiprocessing module. It might be better now. And if you're writing a distributed app, well, choose a good DB and uh, let it do all the hard work. Uh, okay, so the question is, in the multiprocessing model, uh, 
after forking doesn't do an exec? Um, well, that's a great question because after forking, the most logical thing to do is to do an exec. And this is actually how spawn or popen is implemented. And no, that's not what they did. Okay, so the question is, uh, gevent monkey patches everything, and how does it play well with C libraries? Well, uh, again, great question. It doesn't play well, and when there are C libraries, we have to be very careful in how we uh, run them in the background. And usually, it does not mix with gevent. The question is, uh, do we use pure Python libraries sometimes just so we can use gevent? And the answer is, uh, we had never really had to choose like that, but I guess it will be a factor, yeah. Okay, so the question is, uh, we had to parse a lot of things, and did we consider uh, uh, doing a parallel parsing not necessarily in Python, right? Did I understand it correctly? Or just optimizing, or just optimizing the parser themselves? Well, uh, the problem is that we have a, very, a, a lot of very different uh, types of data that we had to parse. Now, most of them were XML files, and then we did use the LXML module, uh, which plays quite well with running it in, in a sub-process and utilizing more uh, CPUs. Uh, the problem is that after we parse, we have to do a lot of uh, logic that can only be done in Python, like uh, matching the, uh, the exact value that we see in the file with a cell object that we have in the database. So, all this is a bit more difficult to uh, implement in some C extension or something. Uh, yeah, so Greenlet is uh, basically an, an implementation of Coroutine. Uh, I think uh, it started off with, uh, uh, it has roots in uh, what was called stackless Python back in the day. Uh, but it's uh, kind of an object, well, written in C, and it holds a, uh, a state of an interpreter in terms of uh, stack and the uh, current uh, process. And so it's, you can think about it like a generator, but uh, not exactly a generator. Uh, sorry, that's all, that's all I can have to say in, <laughs> in, this, in a few words. Okay, well, ah, okay, last question, I think, because, yeah. yeah. Uh, sh again? Did we consider the actor model from other languages like, uh, like we have in Akka? Uh, well, yeah, we considered this paradigm, but uh, it was, I mean, uh, it was very easy for us to use existing code which was written in a very synchronous fashion. Uh, so like changing and rewriting all your code in a different model is, uh, well, more difficult. Okay, well, uh, thank you very much.